Um, we're going to do five minutes uh, question for the panel, and then in the spirit of doing disruptive things in cooperative, mutually supportive environments, we're going to do an interesting uh, table experiment uh, after that. Uh, gosh, a very, very prompt question here at the front. I'd like to say who you are. Um, hi, my name is Sharon Tyne, and I'm, I'm from Age UK London, the London Regional Organisation. I was just interested to hear you say that uh, the government officials said that the... Uh, the public sector was, what percentage five was? Years, five, five years. Five behind years behind the private, private sector. sector. So can anybody tell me how many decades or centuries the voluntary sector is behind? And they're the ones without the money, and they're the ones that are the community, and they're the ones that, that are looking after the vulnerable people that are not online. I, you know. Thank you, great question. Any brief thoughts and comments? I'm going to keep them to kind of 30-second responses if, if you want to comment so we can get through a couple of questions. I mean, if I could just, just reply, I think, um, I think government have woken up to the fact uh, that there's need for change. Um, and I know Matt Huck Hancock was here earlier on today. Of course, Brexit is top of the agenda. Uh, efficiency and reform is next. And it had that, it's, we're back to efficiency and reform. Um, I think it's outcome-based. So we talked today about some of, the, some of the reductions in budgets required. So I think it's taken that outcome-based approach to you know, solutions that can be put in place in order to deliver the change required that is, is needed. And I do think government are getting there, actually. Can I add? I, I also think it's about collaboration. And I think you see a lot more collaboration. Ben spoke about some of the programs that O2 are run. You know, and I could talk about, and I think there's more cooperation and collaboration today between particularly private sector and the third sector than there has ever been. And I actually think the digital disruption we're going through actually facilitates that. I think there needs to be more of that. But when I look across a lot of the programs that are running through organizations like Digital Leaders, but also organizations, some of the industry like Tech UK, actually that I think all of that's encouraging. And that's about making it easier for those collaborative relationships to work. I think it's interesting, isn't it, that, that local services increasingly encompasses third sector as well as traditional local governments, yeah. and, and it's beginning to kind of blend those. Another question. I know it's the after lunch slot, everybody, but I'm sure we can manage another question for our illustrious panel right at the back there. Uh, there's a mic coming to you. It's going to be hopeless without it. Two seconds. Here we go. I'd like to say who you are. Thanks. Uh, Rosalind Scott, MobiCycle. Uh, my question is around pilots and greater transparency around which companies can, can collaborate with the local authority and who pays for it. I congratulate Wigan for the half million um, funding, but in my experience, it's, it's quite a, a difficult, it's almost a minefield getting the pilot um, negotiated. So if you could give any um, insight into easier ways for the private sector to pilot. Sounds like one for you, Alison. I don't know if we... um, I think the community investment fund I talked about was from our reserve. So in that respect, it wasn't you know, um, a government grant. So we've basically taken our reserves to do an investment. Um, but in terms of pilots, um, you know, it depends what the contract situation is. If you're a private sector organization wanting to pilot something, most local government sector would want to embrace that. Obviously, there's issues around procurement, but we're looking at more uh, innovative ways to do procurement, and different councils have different thresholds and different uh, ways to do procurement, so they may be doing collaborative procurement with other uh, authorities in their uh, region or their sector. So there are ways in. It's perhaps a, a conversation, but it's just um, certainly from a Wigan perspective, that was the investment that we did uh, into our communities. Great, thank you. Let's have one last question. Uh, there's one over here, yes. Hi. In possession of the mic already. Go for it. Hi, my name is Nari Scott. I work for Cambridge County Council in Digital Inclusion. Uh, it's basically a message for O2. Um, I live in rural Cambridgeshire. And I speak not just for rural Cambridgeshire, but for a lot of people here in that it's admirable that you're investing money in going into 5G. But even on Thursday, while picking up my child from school, I couldn't check the internet, 
and I haven't been able to do that for 10 years in one of the villages, and I can actually plot where I can and can't get the internet. Yeah. That shouldn't be the case now. Yeah. So um, w what I would say about that is our 4G network, which effectively is where most of the data is now going, that we've got a commitment to uh, Ofcom and the government to, to be at 98% coverage by the end of 2017. So we're at about 80%. Um, in fairness, it, we are starting where the big population of the UK is, so we're through 700 towns, but there will be, there will be pockets where uh, you know, we have gaps, just like there will be pockets from, from some of the other network operators. But the commitment that we have as part of our licensing agreement, um, that actually some of the others don't have, is that by the end of next year we'll be at 98% coverage. So hopefully, um, hopefully you'll get uh, some improved coverage in, in the very near future. Terrific. I'd like to thank um, our illustrious panel, Emma, Mark, Alison, and Ben, very much for spending uh, the time with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you.